in its iron grip. True to the idea of an essay as trying out an idea, the week in Le Vouch began with a seminar on the question of the essay film. <clears throat> so the first day of the five days we had went in a sort of a seminar, a discussion. Through a reflection on thought images, as I call it, which I see as the result of image thinking, I argue for the intellectual gain to be had from essaying thought artistically. Last year, I published a big book about this issue. And amazingly, the publisher was so committed to this book that they released it in paperback immediately and offering a 30% discount on an already modest price. So it is affordable for students. This is the flyer of the book and I'm just ever so pleased. And she said, this publisher said when they uh, decided to publish it, which was done very quickly, uh, she wanted to make me proud. Well, she did. In addition to the opposite of totality, Partial also means subjective in the sense of acknowledging that what the essayist brings forward cannot pretend to be an objective, factual truth. Passionate in that the holder of the view brought forward cares about it. And rational, since partiality also encompasses the wish to persuade, which can only be done through rational argumentation. As for fragmentary, this accords with the non-totalitarian and the non-total. So do keep these two words in mind. That attitude makes you an essayist as a cultural analyst. When thinking with Adorno about a subject for my essay, uh, my essay film experiment, the figure of Cassandra came to my mind. Through so that mythological, uh, that mythical figure who could foresee the future but was cursed to never be believed, I tried to figure make a figural shape for the thoughts on the indifference of people towards the imminent ecological disaster of the world, in addition to the refusal to listen. And this is an issue that encompasses time. Now, this verb to figure is key to what I aim to argue about in the productive merging of intellectual and artistic work. In his 1971 PhD thesis, French philosopher Jean-Francois Lyotard argued for the language as more dynamic than it is usually seen, turning it into a force, a movement, and he made it more sensorial. And this brings language itself already into the realm of the cinematic. As such, he argued, language is closer to the Freudian unconscious as laid out in the interpretation of dreams from 1900 than to any saussure derived structuralist conception of it, dynamism as opposed to structural stability. And this view creates waves that might work for transferring not just meaning, meanings, but thoughts and their forms, including but not limited to images from one medium to another. And due to a blindness for the intermediality in theoretical writing, the importance of visuality in Freud's theory of interpretation has been more often than not neglected, whereas it is crucial for his thinking, including especially force in his concept of language. And Lyotai describes meaning as sense, including sensuality, in terms that include affect, sensation and intuition, movement, and also spatiality. For him, language and the meanings it produces is primarily dynamic. Force for Lyotard is inherent in language. And it is, and I'm using here David Roderick's wonderful um, explanation of Lyotard's work and in his paraphrases, Force is nothing other than the energy that folds and wrinkles the text and makes of it an aesthetic work, a difference that is a form. And if it expresses anything, it is because movement resides within it as a force that overturns the table of significations with a sayism that makes sense. And that word sayism 
uh, which invokes movement and force, particularly power is particularly powerful in this revision of what language is and does. Howard wraps elbows with cinematic figuration. And these words affiliate language with specifically cinematic language based on the etymological sense of movement, kinetic from the Greek, rather than any technical specificity. I apologize, but I have to, to blow my nose. Now, in each German uh, writer, Christa Wolf's novel, apart from a short par first paragraph that gives her literally a place, the novel is entirely written in the first person. If you read it, you cannot help listening to this woman. Here's the beginning of the novel. It was here. This is where she stood. The, the stone lions looked at her. Now they no longer have head, heads. Time comes in here. After a few short sentences, Cassandra slowly recuperates narrative power. Quote, this fortress, once impregnable, now a pile of stone, stones, was the last thing she saw. Seeing her final act of perception in this, in this presentation of Cassandra, what I term focalization in my neurological theory, casts her gloomy eye on the destructive passage of time. And this is reinforced by the final short sentences of that paragraph, which enlists us all. No trace of blood can be seen seeping out from beneath. Point the way into darkness, into the slaughterhouse, and alone. Now, the passive voice and the negative of can be seen indicates that we readers as co focalizers are as powerless as Cassandra is. And that final clause foregrounds the fate of this young woman death by violence, slaughterhouse, and loneliness. This beginning of the novel sets us up as listeners, the listeners Cassandra lacked. From the nine lines of this opening paragraph on, we are compelled to listen to the voice of the first person, as it's called in uh, traditional grammar. This narratological element is a mini essay in itself. It contends that we must learn not about art, but from art about the world, time, urgent matters that need intervention. And looking at its details helps that learning. In this sense, a fictional novel has the two fundamental features of an essay in Adorno's view of partiality, fragmented, not whole, and subjectively passionate. Now, when we then enter into Cassandra's mind, the first thing we read is a single sentence paragraph. Keep in step with the story, I make my way into death. End of paragraph. And then follows the narrative of Cassandra's thought and memories on her final day. For example, the closer you come to death, the closer and brighter are the pictures of childhood and youth. And when she says, I lived on in order to see, the importance of witnessing that special socially relevant form of focalization comes to the fore. Moreover, witnesses, witnessing is the indispensable second personhood that is a precondition of life. Second personhood has been theorized in linguistics, psychoanalysis, and other fields, but nowhere better, nowhere more lucidly and consequentially as by feminist philosopher Lorraine Code. I'll come back to her view later. That's on my screen. Hmm? Sorry? Did you have a, a point? Huh? <clears throat> I will come back to her view at the end. What Cassandra sees is the horror to come. And in the act of seeing, she is aware of the force as well as the problematic of time as we read later on. Another quote. For it was, it is an experience when I see, when I saw. So the outcome of this hour was our destruction. Time stood still. Now this aspect of time and the urgency to finally listen to Cassandra's prediction of destruction 
interwoven with the testimonial vocalization, seeing with her is what makes this novel relevant for, and in fact, an essay on the issue of time it obliquely invokes. To see, but not in a voyeuristic riveting, as, the, as Adorno has warned us after the Holocaust. His caution was not an iconophobic censoring, but an appeal to deploy our capacity for empathy. Today, we see how war and other forms of violence and the willful neglect of the ticking time bomb of destruction of the planet are rampant. If only we would listen to Cassandra. Now, as a literary scholar and cultural analyst, analyst specialized in narrative theory, I examine how literature, fiction, novels, art, those products of the imagination can support a necessary insistence on this issue, usually considered political. I seek to argue and demonstrate, however, that their presence lays not or not necessarily in the thematic or semantic domain. To make this point, I foreground two theoretical issues, both totally traditional, two dogmas in the study of art and literature that I have often tried to critique and subvert. Seemingly apolitical, they both have an impact on such political issues. Now, one <clears throat> is the ironclad idea of chronology as the skeleton of history, the only way to be historically responsible, as it's called, and avoid that historian's object of contempt they call anachronism. The other is the appeal to the author's intention, which is sustained in two different ways. The first is the appeal to biographical information and documents anchored in the belief that every author knows consciously what they want to convey. And this makes cheap of the artistic process of writing that only the surrealists have liberated by their experiments in automatic writing. Moreover, it ignores historical changes in meaning. The second way is the disingenuous invention of the implied author, which is a sort of a dogmatic concept in literary studies. And this is the projection of the critic's interpretation on the text, giving the critic and the teacher an unwarranted authority that unduly silences the students or lay readers. Here you see the covers of three books in which I have made these points. At the background of my thinking is always the persuasion that forms, precisely because of their apolitical appearance, have political impact, more strongly even than official art of activist art. Forms, I contend, are activating. They make you think. Hence Adorno's title, the essay as form has more profound meaning than it would seem at first sight. For chronology, the primary problem is the idea of influence and the passivity of the later writer or artist who can only Im imitate or emulate the prestigious predecessor. <coughs> I have discussed this at length in what I've termed preposterous history, a view of temporality that goes in both directions. On the cover, you see a contemporary work by David Reed, next to a fragment by Caravaggio on the cover of this uh, book here on the left. Um, and the, I was very happy to learn that the book's designer got a big award for this design. It was her idea. Now, the painting by David Reed you have seen appearing in the film, if you have seen it, uh, in the film, It's About Time. Um, uh, you, you saw that also is by the same artist. Um, the argument is that later readers cannot understand the earlier work without the screen of later works hanging between the present and the past. In this sense, the present impacts on the past as much as the more traditional view that is only the past that influences the present. And this more common view implies an ideology of development an evolution from the backwards past to a more progressive future. Ha ha. Reese's defense of destruction belies such optimism. The political violence, and in addition to the horrible wars, the increasing numbers of rapes and murders of women, 
including young girls, and the police brutality against people of color in the US, but also in other places, show that the movement can rather be seen as backwards. The future returns and surpasses the past. And conversely, delving into works from the past counters the contempt for pastness that it implies. The two movements of Me Too and Black Lives Matter are both more actual, more urgent than ever. My resistance against linear chronology is not an anti-historical position, on the contrary. It is because history does not go away and is with us in the present that I argue against the way chronology puts the past at a distance. History is contemporary, and this is the reason for the impersonation of Caravaggio's John the Baptist in the film on Cassandra that is in the exhibition, um, for the way, well, and for the way Walter Benjamin's important quote had to be included. The allusion to Benjamin in the round, thin-framed glasses that the actor playing uh, Aeneas is uh, putting on here underlines this. Every image of the past that is not recognized by the present as one of its own concerns threatens to disappear irretrievably. In the fifth thesis on, of the thesis on the philosophy of history. Now, my ongoing academic struggle with chronology and the idea of authorial intention is always intertwined with my feminist and other political persuasions. And in that struggle, I have encountered figures of young women on, in worldwide famous texts and images also, who are trapped in a bad, say a tragic situation. And this is the case of Cassandra. Many of these works of world literature were written by men, some of bad repute when it comes to women's issues. These texts demonstrate that both dogmas mentioned, chronology and authorial intention, do not hold and in fact hold us back from seeing feminist art and writing when it stares us in the face, even where the author is unaware, let's say innocent of it. And Flaubert is of course one outstanding example. He's known for his problematic relationship with women who nevertheless, but he nevertheless invented emotional capitalism as it is, has been titled later. Decades before Marx and Freud each came up with one aspect of this dual syndrome. This uh, uh, putting this together has been done by Eva Illus, an Israeli uh, uh, sociologist. <coughs> Flaubert's masterpiece, Madame Bovary, stages in fictional form an essay in Adorno's sense about this devastating, devastating social issue that is still with us. In addition to showing that time is not linear, these works also demonstrate that the cultural impact of literature and art is not bound to what the author wants to say. Now think with artworks such as the brilliant installations and sculptures by Doris Salcedo that essayistically entice people to remember past violence and as acts of memory in the present. Cassandra can be considered the personification of preposterous history in the sense that her flimsy present in the text from the past does concern the present, the warning of imminent mortal danger. Harking back to antiquity, the figure of Cassandra is so marginal in the source texts that it took her resurrection in the 1980s to earn the fame that her actions and tragic fate deserved. <coughs> I'm so sorry. In addition to being a victim heroine of Me Too, she's also a companion to Greta Thunberg, roaring up from ancient times. The figure has been turned not only into a feminist, but also an environmentalist and an anti-war activist. Cassandra, the young woman, needs, requires, and has the right to be heard, listened to. It's about, it's about time we listen. Hence the title of my film with it, its intended pun. It analyzes and discusses time 
in this theoretical sense of prepostures, of the non-linearity, and it warns us that it is time to act. An academic intellectual issue bound to social political issue in reality. Art is not opposed to, nor an escape from, but an integral part of reality. Now, <coughs> literature and, fir- and film, but also painting, can develop essay art. Thought alive that is partial in the two senses of the word, subjective and fragmented. The form of Malani's 30 panel painting that you already saw intimates not only a cinematic quality as well as fragmentation, but also suggests detailed looking, go from screen to screen. The panels are both separate and due to the figurations, continuous. Cassandra speaks through Malani's distorted voice also in Malani's 2012 video shadow play in search of vanished blood that was in the documenta. The essay is literally a trying. And we know that in English, that also means difficult, challenging, trying to do something in trying times through activating forms. Heeding Malani's, Wolf's, and other great artists' warnings, the beginning of Wolf's novel and its narratological particularities, its forms, Cases in the role of the listeners that Cassandra did not have. As I mentioned from the short opening paragraph on, we are set up as readers, addressees of the narrative or narratives to listen to the voice of Cassandra, the first person who speaks the novel in its entirety. Apart from that short beginning, I quote it, <clears throat> this narratological form solicits us to be committed, to be empathic empathetic witnesses, to be witnesses who care. It goes to show that art, and in this case, it's literature, um, is not superfluous, it's not basically an economically and politically useless way of, to, of relaxing, to kill time, to kill time, we call it. Instead, I argue in all my work, we must learn not about art, but from art. Art as the teacher about, no, for the world, for time, peace, and other urgent matters that need intervention. Now, and looking at its details, including the forms, assists us in that learning. And that is the essay side of art. The backbone is Cassandra's temporal awareness. Her repeated call for urgency is key. And the most personal intimate moment in the film, I thought should be the the one when the near future infringes on the figure's personal lives. And this is when Cassandra dumps Aeneas, breaks off the relationship because he remains too close to the powers that be, resulting in a near future in which he would become stultified. And this concerns the future once she rejects. At the end of the novel, She abandons him, this is not the end of the film, but the end of the novel, with the poignant words, I cannot love a hero. I do not want to see you being transformed into a statue. She breaks off their relationship because the call to war deprives Aeneas of his sweet nature, and that is what Cassandra cannot bear. Now, time is a timely topic. There are two more, here are two more passages from Bull's novel where Cassandra teaches us about time. Uh, You have to go back one slide, uh, Roger. No, back. Yeah, these are the two passages. Uh, Then my resolution was formed, smelted, tempered, forged, forged, and cast like a spear. I will continue to be a witness, even if there is no longer one single human being left to demand my testimony. And the second is also very poignant. The Troy of my childhood no longer exists except inside my head. I will rebuild it there while I still have time. I will not forget a single stone, a single incident of light, a single laugh, a single cry. It shall be kept 
faithfully inside me, however short a time may be. For now I have learned to see what is not, how hard the lesson was. Okay, now from the image in time to the temporality of images, especially the moving images of film and video, time is currently being considered in its many aspects and manifestations. It's very much a hot topic. Think of sequential ordering, duration, rhythm, memory, uncertainty and undecidability, movement, affect and suspense, and the kind of time the combinations of these aspects entail, such as deep time, geological time, narrative time, and more. Now, some also bring these considerations of time to bear on the capitalist time in which we are submerged. Moreover, it is useful to remember that clock time dating from the colonization period is fundamentally in the interest of capitalism. Now, let me end with some words on the concept I see as very important for our intellectual artistic work, intellectual friendship. In my visit to universities and art schools, I taste always a sense of collaboration and debate where all participate on an equal level. And for me, that's an ideal of teaching. In addition, in addition to commitment to such attitudes and realizing the ongoing tension between academic analysis and politics and other practices, I've been compelled to connect artistic with academic practice. And this began with documentary making, which I started to do in 2002, in order to get a more direct and personal insight into the lives of the people I wanted to understand better. There was no more effective mode than friendship of studying and analyzing contemporary culture. What happens results stored in the libraries, the primary tool for academic work. Now, how does this integration of filmmaking and thinking have potential for a different practice of our mission of teaching? Where the collaborative spirit I mentioned is key to a successful practice. In philosophy, the figure of the teacher, a conceptual persona, is traditionally presented as the lover. In her book, What Can She Know? Feminist Epistemology and the Construction of Knowledge, that uh, philosopher, uh, philosopher uh, Lorraine Cote, whom I mentioned before briefly, takes this tradition and turns it around. For Cote, the concept metaphor that best embodies her idea is the friend, not the lover. Moreover, the conceptual persona of the friend, the mode of friendship, is not embedded in a definition of philosophy, but of knowledge of a different kind. This definition necessarily takes knowledge as professional as a process. Knowledge is knowing that reflection cannot be finished. Moreover, knowledge is not the first place in the first place to learn something about, but to learn something from. Knowledge, not as substance or content out there waiting to be appropriated, but as the how-to aspect bears on such learning from the practice of disciplinary, interdisciplinary cultural analysis. Now, friendship is a paradigm for knowledge production, the traditional task of the humanities, but for them production as an interminable process, not as a preface to a product. And code lists the following features of friendship as opposed to the lover's passion as productive analogies for knowledge production. Such knowledge is not achieved at once, but it develops. It is open to interpretation at different levels. It admits degrees. It changes. Subject and object positions in the process of knowledge construction are reversible. It is a never accomplished constant process. The more or lessness of this knowledge affirms the need to reserve and revise judgments. And this is very important, of course. And this list helps to distinguish between philosophy in the narrow sense as a discipline and turn it into a potential interdiscipline and relate it as the preposition inter means to the humanities as a more general field, rhizomatically organized according to a dynamic interdisciplinary practice. Now, I propose, propose to take this very seriously, not only to make a profile of a good teacher, 
but also of a good neighbor, for example, who is interested in developing friendship with others from which they can learn. And this, I think, is a good characterization of a teacherly personality, which I reckon is contagious, touching colleagues and students alike. It solicits collective thinking. I'm convinced that the exhibition that Roger curated will have that kind of contagious effect. And so do take the time to visit it as a companion. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for that, Mika. That's uh, very generous of you to struggle through with your cold and you've given us a lot of things to think about. Um, as I said at the beginning, many of the people in the audience are, are students um, um, from our art history program and from elsewhere. So it's really wonderful then for them to get to hear from you firsthand. Thank you very much. Now, for the people in the audience, you're welcome to um, ask questions. Um, Mika Bal has generously agreed to stay on for a discussion of, of her lecture and, and of her work more generally. Um, if you're here with us in Zoom, please feel free to raise your digital hand um, to ask a question or to type it directly into the, um, into the chat box. Um, and for those who are joining us on YouTube, you can ask questions by scanning the QR code here and asking the questions in Slido. So I will make the most of my privilege of being uh, the moderator for your talk, Mika, by asking the first question, if you don't mind. And I, I'd like to, to, to pick up near where you left off um, in your discussion of friendship and its relationship to teaching. Um, I think one of the one of the key ideas in your lecture today, and indeed one of the key ideas in so much of your work, has been that we should not be thinking about learning about art, but rather learning from art. And I think this is a very powerful concept and one which uh, is both very simple and very complex. So my question, given that we have so many students as well as educators in the audience, my question is, how do we go about doing this? What what kind of um, what kind of training or skills or sensitivities do we need to cultivate? Um, or to put it in a different way, um, how can we teach or how can we learn um, the kind of image thinking that you've, you've demonstrated for us today? Well, there is obviously another lecture there to give uh, for which we have <laughs> no time. But uh, to put it very simply, I think this, and this is why I chose Cassandra and this, uh, this issue of listening. I think listening is this is putting yourself as the second person. And the second person is gets the turn to be the first person. And I think for uh, uh, you have listening, but then there is also looking and in our visual work, that is very important. Look at the artwork and then think not what the artwork must mean to its maker, for example, but what it means to you. And if you are a student, you can bring that up in the class and say, for me, this means, what is that green square there? For me, this means this or that. And then the other students and the teacher, all on equal basis, can respond to that because then the first and second person uh, swap uh, places and, and say, well, for me, it's something else, or for me, it is exactly that. But the, the point is, there is an image or a text from which you learn something. And uh, what you learn is not the truth. It's not the end of knowledge. It is something that puts you on the track of developing knowledge. And I think that is the important thing. Now, how you do it, <clears throat> for me, the most important thing in teaching is that the equality between the teacher and the students has to be respected. And it doesn't mean that they're the same, they're not identical. The teacher is older, has studied, has done things that the student hasn't done yet. So more experience in a sense, but the students come up from a different time, a later time, and come up with their own new ideas. And if the teacher doesn't listen to that, there's an opportunity that you, that you miss to learn. And I think learning is more important than knowing. Learning is, is a sort of way of life. I, I feel like an addiction to learning. 
if I don't learn anymore, what do I do here? What's the point of, of life? So I think it is really important to, to respect uh, the equality in that sense. They are not the same, but they're they're different, of course, they have different histories, different uh, trajectories, but they are equal. And so it is really important that a teacher is not just simply reading a lecture and, you know, and um, as I have been doing here, but uh, uh, that you actually uh, uh, provoke students uh, to respond and to come up with something, to respond not to you necessarily, but to the picture or to the novel and uh, have an opinion about that. And there is never a last word. So I think that equality in teaching, that's the way of you know, learning to learn, learning to learn from art, from each other, about the world and for the world. And that I think is really important. In, in teaching. And so it's not about, uh, you know, we need to know everything of, of 19th century art and then we can have a diploma. The, the point is not that diploma. The point is to get enough closeness to what you see and what you hear and what you read to be able to work with that. And that is the learning, the ability to work with the things that you see and art the point of art and of literature is to make you do that. And that's why I made that little point about uh, not so much activist art, although that can be very important. I'm not despising that or anything, but activist art is, a, is tell you what to think about a certain issue. But activating art is to make you think. And then it's up to you what you think. And activating art allows you or enables you, facilitates the possibility to change your opinions. And there is nothing more important, I think, in society that people, than that people change their opinions, that are not fixed. Everything that's fixed is problematic. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mika. That's a very generous answer. Um, I'd remind our, our audience that you're welcome to ask questions either by raising your hand or typing them into the chat. Um, Mika, you mentioned that you have an addiction to learning, but it seems to me you also have an addiction to making. So my next yeah. question is about the different kinds of making that you've been practicing. Now, I think you mentioned during the lecture that you began making films in 2002, which was yeah. more than two decades after you began publishing books. Um, so my question is, what led you to take up uh, an artistic and filmmaking practice and and perhaps more more generally what is it that you can do in in your artistic practice in, in making films that you can't do in in other forms of research and writing yeah that's a, that's the key question <clears throat> about about my my work and my own question to myself the, there was an occasion there was always an occasion something that triggers yeah. So the occasion was that I had a neighbor, I was in Paris for a semester, I had a neighbor who suddenly came up with his arm in a cast in the courtyard. And I said, hey, what happened to you? And he said, oh, long story. And I said, would you like to talk about it? And come on in and uh, let's have a, a chat. And he told me the story, which was you know, about his being treated unfairly by the visa authorities that refused him the visa that all his fellow students did get uh, did uh, have and um, he didn't get it and so he was very upset and threatened with uh, exportation he was uh, uh, tunisian so he had a background in an arabic country and for me it was really important that that triggered my wish to be a witness to be an empathetic witness and to develop a friendship to know better what was going on. Because we have all the books about, you know, what, what happens in the between the, the populations and all that, but to really get to know someone. And so I decided uh, to make a film about his situation when he settled it and he, he managed to, he won the battle against bureaucracy and he ended up uh, with French nationality and 
uh, it was all very wonderful in the end. But for me, the, uh, the point was to develop a friendship with him and his family to be able to make a film in confidence where they wouldn't be shy and wouldn't feel restrained. But I was just welcomed as a friend. They were incredibly hospitable. And that welcoming made it possible to know really what was going on between, you know, in this case, between him and the authorities and uh, all the difficulties and the unfairness. And <clears throat> so it was an incredible experience. And I felt that I had learned more in the, that very short period in which I made the film than I had in, in studying all the books about immigration and, uh, you know, the interculturality and all that. So I started to be really enthusiastic. And then I had, uh, I needed an Arab translator for the subtitling because there were some bits in Arabic. And I had a student who was uh, a Palestinian. And so he helped. And then in the end, and this is the, this is the thing, when you finish with a project, you must know that. What now? What do I do now? I finished this. And so do you feel a little down for finishing? And so <clears throat> the next thing we said, he said, this Arabic student, he said, well, I'm just going back home to see my mother. And then when I come back, I, I'm going to get married to a Dutch woman. And uh, it was, uh, and so we said, can we come along on your trip and film? The situation because we had the situation of the foreigner in France, but then there was now the situation of the the guy going back home, and it was the opposite situation. Oh yeah, lovely, and he was very enthusiastic. And uh, so two of our group went with him, but they were not allowed in. They were just stopped at the border, and they couldn't go because one was Irish. And Irish are terrorists. So he was not allowed into Israel. And so the uh, you know the Palestinian student was just put in a bus and, and taken to Gaza and all that. And then <laughs> these two guys who were going to do the filming couldn't do it. So they went out into Egypt and uh, did some really interesting stuff there, but nothing for the film on the Palestinian and his mother was possible. And then two weeks later, I got a little a Federal Express with an, a tape in it. He had asked a friend to do the interviewing and the discussions with him and his mother uh, so that I would have the material to make the film that we wanted to make. And so this was another occasion where the friendship and the, the, the trust were more important than the books and the, 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 you know, the statistics and all that. And so if I got really addicted, and you say, you say it right, I'm also addicted to that sort of making, because that making allows an entrance into the subjects that goes right through the, the literature in, in the library. And in, in this first film, for example, that was uh, done by the, about the, uh, the uh, Tunisian uh, guy, there were, there were a few images that were so amazingly, totally contradicting our stereotypes of the uh, Islamophobic uh, way of reasoning that I thought, this, you can only do this visually. You can only see it. There was a moment that the father of the bride, because he ended up marrying uh, a, a young woman, and, and that's how he got his, uh, his papers, uh, the father of the bride was sitting and they were all singing and partying. And next to him was his little daughter, who was a, a smaller daughter, who was 14. And at the other side was a neighbor, uh, a woman from the neighborhood who was also partying. And the girl, at some point, took a, a scarf, a woman's scarf, and put it on her father's head. There was a moment, like, what happens now? And the father looks in the camera and smiles. And for me, that was so incredibly wonderful. 
that he wasn't angry, he wasn't upset, he didn't take it off. The, the neighbor woman actually took it off his head, but he was sitting there, smiled as if he was happy to just show his other face. And that was uh, something how, that you, you would never encounter that in literature and in studies. And so for me, the, the, the making is a way of getting to know better and more depth and more unexpected things because also the visual thing uh, counts and the friendship that you need in order to be able to, to be allowed in, so to speak, the society that you want to know better. If you don't have, if they don't trust you, they would shut up. And so this was, this. it's, it's another methodology, you could say. It's another method of getting to uh, develop knowledge. Thank so you for, for that, thank you. Mm. So and and th that book that I published in 2022 is all about that, how the films helped me think. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the audience, please? feel free to raise your hands. I think I see a question in the chat. Um, this is a question from my colleague in the School of Humanities. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Bal, for the marvelous talk. My question follows on from your fascinating reflections about the essay as a flexible form that resists totalitary, totality and totalitarianism. Might you be able to say a little more about the best essays that you've read and what you think are some rhetorical and thinking moves that the most thought-provoking essays make? Thanks for the question, Li Chi. Another lecture there. <laughs> <laughs> and I would need a few days to, to think and read, but no, it's a good question. It's a very good question. It, I think it is, uh, for me, the essays that have most uh, impressed me or inspired me, it's about inspiration, are not necessarily uh, the essays that I read for the knowledge that I needed to write an, my own essay, to write a book. But the, the, well, I can just give one example because I have recently reread it. Uh, the, this Polish uh, art historian who also came from art history and from art uh, uh, practice, Filip um, Lipinski, had written and suddenly sent me out of the blue I had met him once for very briefly, uh, an essay he had written about my work, about what he calls, and I call, thinking in film. And he wrote that essay before the book came out, that, uh, you know, uh, some years before. And it was an amazing essay, and what I found most inspiring, and this has to do with that uh, sort of the looping of a friendship and development and nothing is finished and the non-totalitarian and the non-total, he had studied my work, but also the work of others and other filmmakers and other film scholars and had woven it all together. And that made for, for me an incredibly inspiring uh, uh, you could call it a textile, a, a sort of intellectual textile of a, a woven uh, ensemble of things that would never come together otherwise. And for me, that that was the most inspiring recent experience I had. But of course, there have been other things that have done a lot for me. And uh, you know, I and sometimes it's the intellectual personality of the writer it's not the intention but the personality and i had for example an uh, a teacher in my french when i was studying french uh, a teacher of medieval literature paul zumtor a swiss guy he became very famous and he he did very well and then he passed away unfortunately but he was i don't know why i wasn't interested in medieval I wasn't at all. I was interested in modern and contemporary. and But I got out of bed early to attend his nine o'clock class simply because of his personality. He jumped around the blackboard and, and wrote things on, and but it was never linear. It was never one thing. And he was so inspiring 
that I have actually hesitated. Shouldn't I look in more into medieval? Instead, I went to the Hebrew Bible, for example, and studied there uh, some, some bits of that uh, as a way of acknowledging from his inspiring teaching and uh, his example and his work to, to acknowledge that things that you don't know and that you don't want to specialize in can be incredibly inspiring. And that has done for me a lot. In, uh, that, that would be an essay in, uh, <laughs> in the other sense, in essay in learning. So Bolson Tour was a very inspiring uh, teacher in that sense. And I never had an, uh, any use for the diploma of that class. It wasn't about that. Just to see this man think, to see him think, that was what inspired me. Thank you, Nika. We have another question from um, our colleague, Karen Moon, the head of our history, who you met earlier. Um, yes. She's written, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts on the crucial and interdependent relationship between art, writing, thinking, politics, and lived experience. Given this interconnectivity, you also seem to advocate for dedicated space for witnessing, thinking with, and learning from art. Can you comment on this simultaneous need for art to be part of the real world, the realm of images and reproductions, and the realm of exhibitions or other discrete art spaces? Oh, this is actually <laughs> calling on my interest, uh, quite recently uh, developed interest in curating. And, and you're in the middle of that. And I am also uh, that the, I, I, I tend to, I'm not sure if I can answer the question more importantly than this, but for me, the curator is a co-artist. He makes, he or she makes the art alive and allows, installs it in such a way that viewers can come in and not be passive, not sit, or stand, which is worse, stand there just looking quickly, take a picture and move on, but engage with the art. And so in, the, in that sense, the artist makes the artwork, but they don't know how it's going to work. And the curator makes the artwork work. And in that sense, the space, the, the, the you know, the architecture of the exhibition, the, the way the space is arranged is absolutely crucial for the for the working of art. And I think that is, uh, for me, that is so important. It is what makes the difference between the passivity of contemplating art, like, oh, this is beautiful, this is good, this is not so good, that sort of judgmental uh, parkour of uh, visitors. And uh, on the other hand, engaging the art, engaging with the art. And I once had the opportunity to make a show at the Munch Museum in Oslo. Uh, and it was the most incredible invitation I've ever received. On a Saturday night, I get an email, would you care to do a curation of our uh, stock of Munch paintings in the museum? and include your Madame B exhibition. What? I had never imagined that that could happen. And of course my answer was yes in capital letters. And I went and I did, and it was fantastic collaboration because the, the, the people working in the museum, curating, caring for the stuff, you know, the conservators and all that, the security people even were engaged in uh, working with me on, on this. And, and it was like, okay, this is what art should allow and facilitate. This collaboration with all levels of professional skills coming together to make the art of the artist who has passed away so he couldn't influence it, but to make the artist work, the art work. And I, I was so, I mean, I'm, uh, this is still one of my more, best memories of, of, of working. And uh, it was a great joy. I'm not sure I'm answering your question adequately, but. Uh... No, I think it's a good answer. Thank you, Mika. And thank you, Karen, for the question. Um, I'd like to encourage the students in the audience to please feel free to, to raise any questions you have. You can raise your hands or you can type them into the chat. Um, 
But in the meantime, um, Mika, I'd like to ask you a question about interdisciplinarity. Oh. Um, as I think I mentioned at the start, many of our uh, students in the art history program are in fact double major students reading both art history and English literature. You have been a long time advocate of interdisciplinarity, of course, and in your 2002 book, Travelling Concepts in the Humanities, you argue for what you call a concept-based methodology. But nowadays, two decades later, uh, interdisciplinarity is something of a buzzword, and many institutions, I would say, um, prize certain kinds of, in of interdisciplinarity above others. Uh, for example, collaborations between the humanities and the hard sciences, rather than collaborations between differences, different disciplines within uh, the humanities, for example. And alongside that, I suppose there's also been a lot of changes in the way that we, we do academic research with things like digital, digital search engines and, and, and databases and so on. So my question is, what do you see as the, the role of interdisciplinary work within the humanities today? And, and what do you see as its, as its future? Yeah, it's a, it's a different, the question has a background as a chronology, right? It is like, <laughs> what is coming next? <laughs> and I have to say, I'm not so good at these uh, 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 AI technologies and all that. It's not my thing. But, but I, I think interdisciplinar the interdisciplinarity is like that friendship metaphor. Interdisciplinarity is not a means for administrators to cancel departments. That is the abuse of it that has happened. It is a way of making encounters, staging encounters between not complete fields. You don't have to get a degree in the other fields before you can do something, but there is a way in which, and that's why I developed the, the concept uh, uh, theory, but for me, interdisciplinarity is you have a question, an issue, an engagement with work, and you think about things that you have not the knowledge of. And you say literature and art. I think that's a really good combination that uh, you have the, the, the literary people have this skill in close reading and in understanding metaphors and, and, and stylistic details. And the art people have an engagement with the image. Now, if you put that together, you can come out with great things. And this is what I try to do with Flaubert, for example, whom I admire deeply as a writer, not necessarily as a, a man, but as a writer, he, he was just brilliant. And everybody is always complaining that he was a misogynist. Yes, right. But he was able to, uh, to use his thinking his creative thinking, and this is where he is interdisciplinarity, creative imaging thinking to create a novel that is profoundly feminist. He wouldn't know the word even, and of course the word wasn't around, but he wouldn't, he would say, oh no, that's not my thing. I'm just describing the social situation. Yeah, I'm describing, no, critiquing it. Critiquing the social situation of his time which is why I object to all the novel, all the films made after Madame Bovary that are all historical costume dramas. And I think they betray his contemporaneity. And so there, the interdisciplinarity requires also this temporal uh, perspective to realize that this was a novel written in a time, about a time, critical, critiquing the time, and so if we make a film now of that same novel, you cannot simply put it in the past because you betray it. And so this is where the interdisciplinarity uh, requires this openness that I propose concepts uh, would help uh, understand. And, and you know, temporality is one of those issues. I don't know if I have a more precise answer, but for me, interdisciplinarity is absolutely crucial, but not as everything goes. It's not anything goes, anything just pick up here and there, nor is it a sort of stultified, you need a diploma in that other discipline. Neither of those 
are true, but you visit it, engage with it, and that becomes a kind of friendship also. Thank you so much, Mika. Uh, we have a few questions coming in um, from the audience. Um, the first is about, uh, the first is from uh, one of my students, Kelly. Hi, thanks for the question. Um, she again, thanks you for the lecture. And she asks how you navigate the relationship between word and image as a filmmaker with an academic background. Does one influence the other more or are both mutually helpful? Well, it's a, <clears throat> it's a difficult uh, question to answer in a direct way because the academic background is for me studying in the university was was you know was a way of gaining and and developing knowledge that would never end and so as i have explained in my lecture uh, it's it's not about that ending it's about a process and so for me it has been very very useful and important to have a background in reading, it, not that it's academic or not, does it even concern me so much, but it's reading as a detailed engagement with the text, with the language, in the sense that Leo Tai has redefined uh, la uh, language as, as moving. And, you know, uh, it's an encounter with language that makes you aware of the value of for example, ambiguities. That's why I'm so fond of ambiguities, to, to understand how things mean different things. And this word trying as an attempt and trying as difficult, that's a, a good example of um, that ambiguity. And you need language for that and literature uh, to, to get that. And of course, literature is also has also a lot of visual sides, descriptions, things that can be compared to images. But then images have this other aspect and force you to look. And I think that if you have reading, close reading and close looking together, you come to something that I don't think any disciplinary program in itself has in its, its you know, schedule. But you have to try to form that yourself, to shape it and to work with, and that's why interdisciplinarity is important. This, this has been very important for me to go from uh, you know, studying literature, which was my first field, turning a corner. I have the tendency of turning corners when I am sort of, when I've done something, I think, okay, I know how to do that now, that's enough, now do something else. And then there are other moments when you know, like how did I come from the Hebrew Bible on which I was publishing a book to uh, visual art, to Rembrandt? How did I come from the Hebrew Bible to Rembrandt? Well, I was publishing a book and I was looking for an image for the cover and I found this Rembrandt etching. And then my brother came and said, how dare you show that etching? It's pornographic. Oh, oh, I hadn't seen that. And so <laughs> my brother pointed it out to me and I then you know, took a slide and <laughs> drew the thing and say, yeah, yeah, you're right. And that's how I got there. So there are also always these coincidences, things that just happen, like my neighbor with his arm in a cast. Things happen and uh, you act upon them. And I guess my skill has been to don't let it pass. When I see something or read something or understand something that is strange, I don't let it pass. I, I stop to examine it. And that helps, uh, has helped me a lot. I don't know. Again, Thanks, I don't Nikki. know if I answered your question. <laughs> I think you have. There's another question that follows on from some of what you've just been talking about. Um, it's from Anne Go, who's a PhD student in history and art history. And she says that she's always thinking about how to balance formal analyses of visual images and interpret and interpretation. How do we know when we have crossed the line to over interpretation or does such a line even exist? How do I know I'm not projecting my own thoughts on an image that might be utterly different from what the makers of the image meant? Does it even matter? She asks. Right. That's the key question. That's maybe it's the overlapping question. Absolutely. Interpretation is never certain, but it cannot be arbitrary. 
So that's why the connection between you as the interpreter and the image that you see or the text that you read, that connection has to be always sort of um, you know, reasoned. And I, I, have, I have a sort of a method for that in my teaching. When we do, uh, you know, when we write an essay, we make an argument and you never know if it is certain, it never is certain, but you make an argument that's of an interpretive kind, you make an interpretation. Then you quote a passage as an example, as proof almost. And you quote an example, uh, an image or a, a passage from a text, instead of then going on and using that example only as an example, what you do, and this is, I think, a key for teaching to make students appreciate that, you go back from, so you make your argument, you have the example, then you go back from the example to your argument. Does it really fit? And this is the question of uh, your student about, uh, uh, am I projecting? Does it really fit? You're, of course you're projecting, but you know you, you, you have the right to project and you don't know what the author meant and what the artist meant. We cannot know, but if you confront the example back to your interpretation, you will notice that it is never quite perfect. It never quite fits. Some things fit, some things don't. And instead of either panicking, rejecting your argument or repressing the difference, you adjust, you continue your argument and you say, okay, if we do this, if we see this, then here this works and this doesn't work. What does that mean? And that is when you learn. That's when you learn something new from the process itself, the, from the confrontation between your, uh, your example and your arguments. And so this is what I have developed in ASCA in the Institute as the slogan. I develop terms, but also slogans. The object always speaks back. The object speaks back. And that helps you. That makes you advance in your thinking. So never be afraid of interpreting, even if you know that you are, of course, projecting. But then how do the two speak together? If you make the object a subject, a second person that can speak back, then you learn more. Thank you, Mika. We have a lot of wonderful questions coming in. Um, the next one shifts us away from the cerebral to the corporeal. Um, Daniel Kong's question, um, he thanks you for your talk and he um, says that while reading image thinking, he was struck by how you related the activity of image thinking to theatricality and other live acts like exhibitions. I would love to hear your thoughts on how you connect image thinking and theoretical fictions to the body. I was very moved by how you wrote about the force of language with reference to leotard, emphasizing the more sensuous, effective and spatial elements of language. Yeah, that's a that's a, also a good point. We all are bodies. We have bodies, so you cannot deny that. So this whole spirituality is is just one aspect, and <clears throat> I think it is really important to acknowledge. Uh, and this is why visual art is so useful because that is closer to the body than you think it is than than just reading. Um, so I think it is really important to, to bring that in. And if I say the object always has the last word, I could also say the object is a subject who addresses you, body and soul. It's never just the soul, it's body and soul. And you are there as a whole. And I think it is uh, one of the fantastic aspects of, of curating is that you are, very involved with the bodies of not only the art bodies, the architecture, but also the bodies of the visitor, which is why I have developed a sort of dogmatic almost uh, preference to um, uh, making seating possible in exhibitions. 
And I was very, very, this was so moving. When I was doing this show at the Moon Museum, I came and the first visit I made, I said, um, I have an issue because you wanted my video work in there and video takes time. So video needs seating. And I think Munch, Munch's work has the same right to time, to visitors time. And a visitor who is just walking through a, a room gets pain in the back and in the legs and it becomes difficult. That's where the body comes in. And so I want seating, I said. And he said, are you kidding? Seating? No way. I said, why not? Because they can take this, they can take the chair and smash the painting. Because they had a sort of collective trauma from a, from a break-in they had had uh, some years before, which had been very serious. And I said, oh, I understand. Let's then do benches that you can screw to the floor or that you can make heavy. And then they cannot do that. So in five minutes, the, the thing was settled. And they had 29 long benches made in a beautiful shape. And people were sitting there. And this is the body where the body requires that. And so I wanted the, the paintings to be low to, so that the benches allows people to sit and look the painting in the eyes, to look the painting directly, the sort of as if you're looking at a, a person. And it works so incredibly well. Not only was there in a big double spread in the national newspaper saying this, this is the best Munch exhibition I've ever seen, but it was also people stayed for hours. And not only older people, there was a, a teenager of 14 years old who was sitting and watching, watching, watching. Then someone came to call me for a meeting and said, oh shit, okay, I go to the meeting, I came back after an hour. And the same young teenager was two benches further, still staring at the paintings. And I talked to her and I asked how, what was it? And she said, well, I've never been able to see, I see these paintings all the time, but I've never been able to see this because it had given, she had given it time. And that was possible because the body had been treated to comfort. And for me, that has become, I mean, I, I would like to put this out all over the place, put seating in exhibitions so that people can actually take the time and feel comfortable. And this is a bodily issue. It's just an example. Thank you, Mika. Yes, and uh, we've spoken about this before, but your writing on this topic is is has been an important inspiration for my inclusion of seating. In fact, artworks as seats throughout the exhibition that's here at NTU. We have another question which relates to this issue of curating. Um, it's from a master's student, Kai Latip. Um, she asks if uh, she asks you to reflect on the role of the curatorial in establishing a conducive environment for the art to work and to induce thinking and learning from art amongst amongst us amongst your participants now i think you've already spoken a, a little bit about this in, in relation to seating but do you have further thoughts on what curators need to do to create the conducive environment for the art to work well i think one of the <laughs> for me one of the things that work is messiness not make it linear, not make it chronological, but like in, I have this installation on Don Quixote, which is, of course, a very messy novel. And there again, like with Flaubert, I had to be loyal to the novel by making the exhibition messy. And I put benches in all sorts of directions, never on a row, always sort of this way, that way, that way. And the screens also. So when you came into the, you can see that on my website, when you come into the, the curatorial space, the, the, the room, the gallery, you know, there is nothing that tells you where to start or nothing that predicts that you have to start that way. And that makes it, this is another way of activating you. You choose where you go. And the chronology is not the point. The artist's intention, we don't know, and I'm not sure it matters. It is what you see. And how do you see it? If you get the, the seating, you have the time. So the time helps your body. 
and then the whole uh yeah the whole the whole way of going through the curatorial uh process i think for a curator it is really important to design it in such a way that it can be more than one thing that, that there is there is not a one two three four five you you can do that but you can also do it differently and that is very helpful that's that's really it makes it possible for you to feel as a visitor that you are also in charge and that you have your own power and that is important that the visitor is empowered and is on an equal footing as the student's uh, teacher uh, equal footing the visitor and the art should be on an equal footing and the curator has to facilitate that by doing it in a certain way uh, mm. that is not necessarily linear. Thank you, Mika. So in praise of seating and in praise of messiness. I like this. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have two questions about time um, and I'm going to read them together so that perhaps you might you might be able to answer them together. Um, the mm -hmm. first is from Cheryl Gui, who's an undergraduate student here. Um, she notes that you mentioned different kinds of time, deep time, geological time, narrative time, clock time, and capitalist time. And she asks, what kind of time do we find in the process of making and looking at images and artworks? And how might this relate to or, or differ from the kinds of time that we find in, in language and narratives? So that's mm -hmm. the first question. Right. The second question um, is from Cheryl Lee. Um, She's a PhD student in art history, and she uh, is curious about the intersection of art and religion within shared public spaces across a span of time. Yeah. So she found your treatment of the formlessness of time particularly illuminating, and she wondered if you could share a bit more about your thoughts on the movement between the supposed secular world and its time, and that of the world of the sacred, and how one could potentially utilize this concept of formless time to explain what they're feeling and thinking as part of having an aesthetic experience in that space. So two okay. questions, both about time, over to you. Thank you. Yeah, uh, just say in two words, the first again. Um, the, the time in making and looking at images and artworks and the time in uh, language and narratives. Yeah, okay. That, uh, the, of course, that, that is an important difference is that to read a novel, you need, a, you need time. And even if some people read faster than others, they always need time because it is a time-based art. Language is time-based. Now, the, the dogmatic idea is that images are not, that you can look in a glance and move on, that you can take it on, you can take it in, in a glance. That's false. That's not true. You cannot. You also, go through the image, not in a linear way, but you take time to see this and this and these details. And if you don't, you, you spoil, you waste your own opportunity to encounter the art. So I think in both cases, time matters, but it is never uniform. You know, as I said, some people read faster than others. There are even people who skip descriptions, for example, because they think they are boring. And uh, I think that's wrong, but that's, you know, they do it. Uh, so time is, it varies according to the uh, interlocutor, as I call them, huh? the other person, the person doing, handling the work, uh, and that differs for each person, but there is always time involved. You cannot completely ignore it. And I would really argue that for visual art, it's the same even if it seems that you can see it in one uh, glance, you cannot. And this is a really interesting thing about looking. If you take looking seriously, it also takes time. So is that an answer? Indeed okay. it is, thank you. And then the second one was, oh, the religious. The yeah. Indeed, exactly. Yeah, so this, this of course, uh, the social, economic capitalist time orders you around. Clock time is a way of telling you, now it's nine o'clock, now it's 10 o'clock and you have to go to the next class. And you know, it's that time is dictatorial. 
And <clears throat> if you go, if you are religious, uh, you will probably go to uh, ceremonies like uh, the mass for Catholics, and you know, and those also are sort of clock timed. They are also predicting how long you stay. But if you are interested, and this here is the vision where the visual also comes in, if you're interested in meditation, for example, staying in a religious space, getting out of that clock time dictatorial uh, you know, uh, system, you can go into a church or in a, a chapel or a temple, or you can go inside um, a religious space. And if you take the time, you take the time, you can, you, you can you, uh, take the time that you want. And for some people, it's really important to sit for a long time to be confronted with the, uh, the religious art, for example, and see that and, and watch it. But you can also just sit there and think. That's the sort of the liberty that such spaces uh, give you that liberty of taking the time that you want. And of course, if you have to pick up your child at, at uh, preschool, uh, you have to adapt to that. That's the clock time coming in again. But, uh, and that responsibility <laughs> makes it really difficult. But the uh, what I call heterochrony is the experience of time that is different for everyone in every situation. And I think it's really important to uh, to acknowledge that. Hi. Yeah. Oh, um, can I just say bye to my husband who is leaving? Yeah. Yeah. Hey. No. No, the photo and yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. About Thank that. you, Mika. <laughs> uh, speaking of time, I'm I'm conscious that the time is getting on, and we do have an, a number of fascinating questions here, and I worry we may not get to all of them. So. Would it be all right if I, if I combine two more questions together for you and we finish up with that? Is that okay to have one yeah, more question okay. together? Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so Celine um, uh, is delighted with your um, advocacy for anachronism and she would like to hear strategies on how to look beyond the present and the surface of an image. Related to this, uh, Ellis Wu um, would like to ask about your film, It's About Time, which of course is in the exhibition. Um, she finds it fascinating how you draw on the mythology of Cassandra and Apollo while linking them to the contemporary uh, issues, contemporary need for listening and, and issues like Me Too, Black Lives Matter, climate change and so on. And so she's asking how you link mythology with present day issues, especially for, for, for lay exhibition uh, viewers. Yeah, so I think well. these two questions are perhaps related, yeah? Yeah, it's true, and uh, I try to be brief. Um, the to re to relate the the legendary or the mythical to the present is often through uh, the structure of of the of the narrative, for example. And in the case of Cassandra, it's very clear that her punishment from uh, uh, Apollo to not be listened to. I mean, it's it's a legendary idea. It's, it's crazy, but it is so actual. It this is what we need to learn about our being human. That you're not always listened to, and you have to somehow enforce that listening. And how you do that is is a difficulty. So I think that the the present actuality of that legend is is very important. And uh, my interest in uh, older stories and legends and, and myths is to do with the actual actual relevance of it for the world now. So you take it out of its its dusty uh, trunk and you put it in the on the table now and then you have a new relationship to it. Now the first question uh, the first question was strategies for how to do that, how to look yeah. beyond the, the, the present and the okay. surface. Yeah, and I think you you've answered that really in terms of asking what an image from the past says to us now, why we need it now. Yeah, yeah. yeah because it is an interaction with, between you and the work, the first mm. and the second person, it cannot be in the past. Mm. It cannot be. Looking happens in the present. Oh, no other way. It has the present tense, even if you know that this comes from another time. 
So yes, you have to look. If you acknowledge that you are part of the looking act, that you're doing that act, that your performative uh, act is to look, you are already in that movement of the present. Thank you so much, Mika. Um, I think that's all we have time for today. Um, mm -hmm. I am so grateful to you for being so generous with us. And I'm really grateful to our audience um, who have asked some really fascinating questions. Apologies to those people whose questions we won't get to answer. There are questions about music, about Merleau-Ponty. We can't get to everything. So I would, would like to end by um, recommending for everyone, not just to see Mika's film uh, in the exhibition at ADM Gallery at NTU, but also to, to read her work. Some of your questions about music, about Merleau-Ponty uh, and other, other matters will be addressed in, in, in her work. So um, please, do, please do make time to spend time with image thinking in this way. Once again, Mika Bal, thank you so much for being with us today. It's been a real honor and a pleasure. And, and from all of us in our uh, history and at the School of Humanities, thank you. Well, thank you for inviting me and for including me in your show, which is fantastic always. And thank you all for having been with us here today. And uh, maybe there will be another opportunity.